Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, Islington Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Jean-Paul. I'm a, a member of uh, Islington Baptist. And if it's uh, your first time joining us, uh, welcome. And uh, I'm happy to, to see that you're here with us today and uh, be able to, to hear God's word and to be a part of our, of our great congregation. So I thought I would uh, open by uh, reading from the first epistle of Paul, uh, the apostle, uh, Corinthians uh, 1, uh, verse 4. Um, Corinthians 1 starts with a, a greeting, but uh, from Paul. So at uh, verse 4, it starts into the real meat of the, the epistles. So uh, I'll start there and uh, you can join in. Um, it says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed to you, or confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that was written by Paul. And uh, Paul had a lot of great things to say. Um, and this was to the Corinthians. And just to remind the Corinthians of, you know, faith in God and, you know, Having that faith, you will be blessed, and there's many gifts that that come with your faith with God. And, you know, these past six months have been very challenging for all of us uh, with the pandemic. And I thought uh, I would share a couple of the, the, the ups, I would say. There's been some downs as well uh, during this challenging time, and I'm sure all of you have had your ups and downs as well. But... I would share with some of the, the positive things that have happened in, in my life over the last uh, six months. Um, you know, I, I, you know, outside of church, you know, I work very hard and, and I don't get to spend as much time with my family. So uh, one of the blessings that God has given me is the ability to spend more time with God, more time with my family, and being able to share meals together around the table has been a real blessing in my life. Um, interestingly enough, we have been able to explore new places and enjoy the beauty of our neighborhood, which at times we may miss or not look at because we tend to, to go elsewhere for, uh, you know, adventures. Uh, but this has allowed us to really explore the Humber West area and the Humber River Valley, uh, which, is, which is quite beautiful. And you can see God's creation in, in the river and in the valley and in the flowers and everything around. Another blessing has been the ability to, to deepen relationships with, with friends and family as we've had to come together in order to, to survive this and to, to strive and, and, and to really succeed in, in this challenging time. Um, there's also a, a realization that, that, was been, that has come upon me and my family and that is the realization that we are all connected and that our choices do impact others uh, whether positively or negatively, and it's made us think about the things that we say and the things that we do to ensure that uh, no matter what we do, we're doing something to help others and not just focusing on ourselves. This pandemic has also provided us with additional patience with life, with, with our family, uh, with different situations, and, and, and that patience and that, that silence allows us to, to commune more with God. Finally, uh, is finding joy in the small things that we may have overlooked. You know, there's the insects outside and, you know, planting a, you know, a plant in the backyard uh, and to see uh, beans growing for the first time. You know, just seeing the joy in my children's eyes when the seed that they've planted has, has turned into a bean plant and, you know, one day we get a chance to, to actually Eat the eat the fruits of our of our labor and, and have beans at, at dinner. So those those have been joyful moments that have been unexpected from from this pandemic. So I'd like to uh, close with uh, a prayer. Uh, so uh, please join me, Lord. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for always being there and and in these challenging times, you know, allowing us to increase our faith and to grow closer to you, Lord, and, and the opportunity to bring others to you, Lord, and and let them to know your the wonder and and, and the, the grace that you provide and the healing and how you are there to, to pull us through in, in more difficult times, Lord. I, I feel very blessed that uh, we have you there with us in our corner and, and they're protecting us and, and helping us and guiding us, Lord. And, and I, I hope that everyone that is watching this today that uh, God is with you as well and that if you haven't had the chance to have a relationship with the Lord, that through today's church, that uh, that you'll have a chance to to meet God and and to and to bring God into your life as well. In Jesus' name, I pray. So I'd like to pass this on to the rest of the team. Thank you so much for for this, and uh, welcome to Islington Baptist.
I want to turn your attention today, uh, and uh, I've got a, a silhouette of a, of a woman wearing a crown, and so it's my artistic mind, and, and, and it's uh, behind one of the wickedest kings of Israel, and at, and, and at his side um, was, a, was a queen named Jezebel. And when you read the scriptures, you read about Ahab and Jezebel and the, the evil that they did in the land of Israel as, as king and queen. Um, Ahab, um, what, and so just as, a, as a, if you're coming into it, you're thinking, we're thinking about Israel, we're thinking about the kingdom was united under Saul and then David and then his son Solomon. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split into two, ten tribes in the north, two in the south. Uh, the book of Kings is focused on the, uh, uh, the events of what's happening in the north. Jeroboam was the first king. He did evil by setting up two golden calves in Israel, one at the top and one at the bottom, said, here's your God, and corrupted the people of the Lord. While successively after him, there, there was a sole string of bad kings. Well, one of the worst, um, in fact, the worst, was Ahab and Jezebel, um, and, and what they did in leading people away from God. Ahab, married to a Sidonian, as I mentioned, named Je Jezebel, uh, he considered Ahab, it says he personally considered it trivial to commit the sins that Jeroboam had committed. And so he invented new ways of doing evil in the sight of God. Um, Jezebel and Ahab were responsible for many of the school of the prophets. Jezebel brought with her the worship of Moloch and the worship of the, of the false god Baal and, went, and had these purges where it was like, hunt down the believers, kill the prophets of God. And in the midst of it was Elijah. Things come to a, um, a, a head when one day Ahab uh, is looking out his window uh, of his palace. He sees the vineyard of a fellow named Naboth next door and he's like, you know, that would be a great spot for my, my new vegetable garden. And so, meanwhile, he's got a whole bunch of land that already belongs to him as king. And so he goes out, he approaches Naboth and says, I'd like to buy your vineyard and turn it into a vegetable garden. Naboth says, no way. You, do you realize that my place in the promised land is, is set by my receiving this as an inheritance from the Lord? This is my place in the promised land. Why would, I, why would I do such a thing as to sell my place in the land? Um, and, and so for 500 years it had been in this family, and the understanding was, this is your, this is your stake. But, and so Ahab goes home all sullen and angry, refuses to eat, and along comes his wife, Jezebel, who's like, how come you're not eating supper tonight? Um, and he's like, well the guy next door refuses to sell me his property. And she's like, don't think about it again. I got this covered. You're going to get that property. And Jezebel, behind the scenes, works out this plan that has Naboth, a righteous man who's just trying to do the right thing, she has him killed. And then she comes home and says, hey, good news, honey. That place you wanted, you can go there and take it. Ahab heads out, but at that very moment, in, uh, and we're going to read it together. At that very moment, God says to Elijah, I got a message for Ahab and his wife, and, it's, and judgment is coming because of their sin, because of their wickedness, because of their evil ways. And Elijah, in chapter 21, meets Ahab at the very moment he's entered into the field of Naboth to take possession of it. And this is, and it's important, this is what he says. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, 1 Kings 21, 16 to 26. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he has begun to take possession of it. And this is what you're to say to him. This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says, in the place where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs are going to lick up your blood, yours. Um, and then, this is what Ahab said to Elijah, so you found me, my enemy. 
Um, I have found you, said Elijah, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. I'm going to wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah. Both of them wiped out because of their sins. Um, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs are going to eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs are going to eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and birds will feed on those who die in the country. And then there's this little postscript, there is never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord had driven out before Israel. So that's the backstory. And so we ask the question, how, when does this come to pass? How does this come to pass? Very specific word of prophecy, word of judgment against a very evil couple. And the question is, is will God's word come to pass exactly like God says? Uh, and, and indeed it does. And so if you turn with me into 2 Kings chapter 9, we are introduced um, uh, to, uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, we're introduced to the agent who God uses to carry out these words. So a bunch of chapters pass by, time passes by, Ahab is actually dead at this point, uh, and yet his wife, Jezebel, is, is still reigning as queen, and her son, Joram, is now king. Uh, and yet the time for the word of the Lord to come to pass has come. And the agent of it turns out to be one of uh, Joram's commanders. Uh, and, and, the, and the scene is such that there was the Arameans, uh, Syrians in the north who constantly were invading the land because of God's hand was, of discipline and judgment was against Israel because of her idolatry. And so God sent enemies to attack them with the idea that they would repent and turn back to God. Um, that's what the afflictions of God are for, to bring people to repentance. Uh, and so... There was the, so Joram had been injured in a skirmish with the, with the, with the Assyrians, with the Assyrians. And so he's, he's gone back, licking his wounds, recovering from whatever injuries he suffered in combat. And at this very same time, Elisha, by the word of the Lord, sends a young ser a servant of his with this message, go and anoint Jehu as the king over Israel. And he has a particular mission in life his mission is to carry out my instructions of judgment against the house of Ahab. That's a very specific mission. And so um, Jehu, though, is a very, uh, you see some pictures. You see a picture of him shooting someone. Uh, you see a picture of, of a whole bunch of dead people at the bottom right. That's a depiction of, from chapter 10 where he, um, in one go, wiped out all the prophets of Baal. So some of the things that he did was good because um, God was using him to purge the land of wickedness. Uh, you, but you, and you also see a little picture, uh, Gustav Doré pictures, um, sketch artist from the uh, 1800s. There's a picture of Jezebel being tossed out a window. Uh, and so these are the acts of Jehu as the hand of, the physical hand of judgment of God. Um, now there's some faults to Jehu, and we'll get into those as well. And yet, uh, God uses him to carry out the words of Elijah that we just read in chapter 21. Um, now, now the, uh, a little bit more about Jehu. Uh, he, uh, he's violent. Um, he's charismatic. People follow him. Um, he, he, there's a bunch of riders that come out from the city that we're going to read in a minute. He's like, get in line behind me. And they get in line behind him. Um, he's that kind of individual. Who's, he's cunning. He's strong. Um, he's also bloodthirsty and violent. Um, he seems to enjoy killing people, uh, which is an interesting thing, and we'll, we'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, he reigned um, of all the kings of northern Israel, and there was uh, almost, what, almost two dozen or something like that. Of all the kings of Israel, he's actually the best king they ever had which isn't saying much when you look at it as a whole because he continued to lead the, the Israelites into worship of these false 
false gods, the golden calves. But as a, as a, as a one king that stands out in terms of he did some good stuff, he's the only one out of, of a whole string of kings spanning hundreds of years, he's the best of the lot. Um, there is actually something pretty amazing. Go to the next slide. This is just, uh, I love finding how uh, the Bible is always backed up. You know, archeology span is a friend of the Bible because it shows that the Bible is not a made up story. The Bible is real people, real places, real events. When you're reading your Bible, you're not reading a myth, you're not reading a fairy tale, you're reading the word of God and have confidence when you're reading the scripture that what it says is, is what really happened and what it says is going to happen is going to happen. This, this stone on the left, for those of you who are able to see it, it's a, really, it's a carved and you can see a blow up of the top picture from the stone. It's called the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. It was discovered in 1865 in uh, Iraq, uh, and it, Shalom on it has inscribed on the other side details of his 31 military campaigns. The Assyrians invaded uh, Israel and were harassing them from the north. Uh, around 827 BC, it speaks about how he defeats Jehu, and Jehu um, bows down before him and pays him tribute. And so if you want, this is the only depiction, uh, relief cut we have of an Israelite king. It's kind of cool, it's on this stone. They didn't have photos or digital storage archives. The guy in the middle on the ground, that's Jehu. So if you're like, is there any pictures of anybody in the Bible? Yes, we have one, <laughs> uh, and, and it's him. But, and, and his name, and he's specifically named on, on, this, on this stone. Um, and how he's defeated, and, he, and it lists the items that, he was, that Jehu gave to Shalmaneser as tribute. Um, and it show, shows that Je, Jehu wasn't allowed just to run roughshod. He faced consequences for leading the Israelites into sin. Um, but it's really kind of cool because the Bible is real people, real places, real events. Uh, Archaeology is a friend of the scriptures. Uh, and so that's a little introduction. So let's look into the passage, and then I got five important lessons uh, before we celebrate the Lord's table together. So this is um, Jehu, who is the uh, God uses to judge the house of Ahab. We see God's word, God's prophecy through Elijah coming to pass very specifically, exactly as God says. It says, then Elisha, who took over from Elijah, then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets, and he said to him, tie up your garments take this flask of oil in your hand, and I want you to go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive there, you are to look for a fellow named Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. And you are to go in, and you are to have him arise from amongst his fellows, and you are to take him into an inner chamber, and then you're to take this flask of oil, and you're to pour it on his head, and you are to say, thus says the Lord, I anoint you as king over Israel. Then you are to open the door and run like the wind. Get out of there. Do not linger. Uh, and so the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, so he obeyed. And when he came, he said, uh, Behold, the commanders of the army were there in a council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And he doesn't know who he's talking to, because it says, And Jehu said, To which of us all? Like, who's the word for? Um, uh, and he said, uh, to you, O commander. And he arose, went into the house, and then the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord over Israel, and you are to strike down the house of Ahab, your master, um, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants and the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab, this is your mission. This is what you are supposed to do. And, and for the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel, and I'm going to make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And dogs are going to eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and no one is going to bury her. And then he opened the door and fled. Mission accomplished. He did his part. Um, so then we see Jehu comes out 
Um, when Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, is everything okay? What did this mad fellow say to you? So much was the respect for the prophets of God. Um, and that he said to them, you know the fellow and his talk. And they said, that's not true. We don't know. Tell us. And he said, thus and so he spoke to me, saying, thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man there took, up, took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew a trumpet, and they proclaimed, Jehu is king. Thus, then the, 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 it progresses, it says, thus Jehu, the son of jo Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram, now then we're told about Joram and his situation. Joram with all Israel, they had been guard, on guard at Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Syria. But when King Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds that the Syrians had given him when he fought the king of Syria. And so Jehu said uh, to them, if this is your decision, so he said to, this, to the men with him, then don't let anyone slip out of the city and tell the news in Jezreel. So he's, this is part of the conspiracy of him going against his boss, Joram, the king. And then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel, for that's where Joram, Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, had also come down to visit. There's an interesting little addition. There's going to be two kings in one spot. Joram and Ahaziah, Joram the king of the north, and Ahaziah the king of Judah, uh, they were actually pretty tight. And so Ahaziah, who only reigned one year, because he gets killed in this passage, um, he only reigned one year. He's going up to see his relative, because uh, they're related through, through Jezebel, of all things. So the corruption of Jezebel had infected the house of Judah itself as well. And so Ahaziah is headed up there to pay his respects and say, hey, hey my brother, uh, I'm sorry you're not feeling well after you got injured in combat. So he's on his way up. Um, so then it says this, Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and he said, I see a company. And King Joram said, Okay, take a horseman and send it to them, and ask them, Do you come in peace? So the man on horseback went out to where Jehu was, and he said, Thus says the king, Do you come in peace? And Jehu said to him, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And the guy on the wall said, the messenger reached them, but he's not coming back. And then he sent out a second horseman, who then came to where Jehu was, and he said, Thus the king has said, Do you come in peace? Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And again the guy on the wall reported, He reached them, but he's not coming back. And, he's drive, and his driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives like a madman. That's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> He's had a reputation. Joram then said, the king then said, okay, I'm going to go out to meet him myself. Make ready. This is a mistake on his part, but anyways. <laughs> he says, make ready. And they made ready his chariot. And so then King Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, they set out, each in their own chariot. And they went to meet Jehu. And guess where they meet? They meet at the site where A. Hab had gone to pick up the property of murdered Naboth. Elijah's words are going to, about to come to pass through the, the prophet. Um, and so they meet, um, they met at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And then when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Do you come in peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be so long as the whorings and sorcerer of your mother Jezebel are so many? Things are going to get, go down right now. And he calls out the witchcraft and the evil and the false idolatry. And so then Joram turned around in his chariot and began to flee, saying to Ahazia, Treachery, O Ahazia! So he's warning, warning Ahazia. And then Jehu drew his bull with his full strength, shot Joram between the shoulders so that the arrow pierced his heart, and, and so he sank in his chariot. Jehu then said to Bidkarazade, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For you remember when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. He's got a pretty good memory, doesn't he? He remembered what Elijah said those years before. 
as Elijah confronted Ahab. And now he says, wow, it's happening. It's coming to pass. So throw him on the ground. Um, now, therefore, take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. Now, when Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagen. Jehu pursued him, and he said to his archers, shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ablim. He then carried on to Megiddo, and that's where he died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem, and they buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah, had begun to reign over Judah. And then the last part, the part that concerns Jezebel and her getting her just end. When Jehu came to Jezreel, so there was two palaces in northern Israel, palace in Samaria, and then there was a summer palace up a little bit further north in a place called Jezreel. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard that he was on his way. And so she went to her powder room and she painted her eyes and she adorned her head. And then she went to the window and looked out. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, do you come in peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And so Jehu lifted up his face to the window and he said, who up there is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him and he said, throw her down. And so they threw her out the window and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses and they trampled on her. Then Jehu went inside and ate and drank. That's nice. Um, and he said, see now to that cursed woman and go and bury her because she's the king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they didn't find any more of her than her skull and her feet and the palms of her hand. And when they came back and told him, he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant, Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one will be able to identify her by saying, that's Jezebel. Now, pretty gruesome stuff, isn't it? And you're like, wow, that's a, that, that's a good Sunday school passage. Um, <laughs> hey, kids, gather around. <laughs> um, the Bible is R-rated in spots. Um, but one of the things here, and there's a number of lessons. Go to the, go to the next slide, please. Um, God's word always comes to pass. Ahab was confronted by Elijah after years of leading the people into idolatry, after purge after purge of the people of God by his wife Jezebel, of the refusal to repent despite opportunities to repent, and said, this is the final straw, you murdering Naboth, and coming to claim his field. And here's some very specific things that are going to happen to you and Jezebel and your house. It's over for you. And we ask the question, does God's word come to pass specifically, or are they just going to get die in some chariot accident somewhere or die of natural causes? No, there, it is going to happen exactly as the, as the prophet of God says by the word of the Lord. That's why we have 2 Kings chapter 9, where detail and blow by blow, as gory as it is, this is the justice and judgment of God being poured out on the, on, on the house of these two wicked people. Judgment is coming to pass because of their sin and their wickedness and refusal to repent. And it happens exactly as God says. And so when you and I, we, we say, okay, you know, when I read my Bible, I can, I can sort of wrap my head a little bit around the things like I see prophet says this, this happens, but I've got questions about the stuff that, that talk about the future, about the return of Christ and the events leading up to his return and surrounding it. And uh, like, I, I have a hard time accepting that. Don't have a hard time accepting that. You keep reading, we keep reading together of every word of God always happens exactly as he says. And so we're called to be a people of faith and when we read about things that, that are yet to come, we say, I know it's going to happen because God has a 100% track record of the things that he says are going to happen always come to pass exactly that way. 
And so we have confidence when we read our Bible. Fulfilled prophecy is a call to trust God, and we see record after record after record of it. The second thing is, it's important for us to note, and this, is, this comes from Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18, is, God says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when people turn to me and live? That's an important verse to bring into this passage because we see a guy who likes killing people, right? Um, he is quite happy to be the agent of judgment on the house of, of Ahab. Um, now, God had said the house of Ahab is going to be wiped out, and very specifically so, but it doesn't say God's happy about it. In fact, when you and I look at the big picture, the outpouring of the wrath of God is never something that God's chuckling about up in heaven somewhere. It's, it's not, it brings no pleasure to the heart of God when he executes his righteous judgment upon people for their sin. And we have to remember that. And that's one of the, the, the contrasts is, is, is Jehu is actually called out in Hosea chapter 1 verse 4 for his bloodthirsty ways. He takes too much pleasure in his job. Right? He actually enjoys what he's doing. Um, and so that's where he's, he takes it too far. He's, 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 a, he's not, he doesn't, he, and then the neat thing is, is w one of the interesting features of our text is Jehu has these moments of self-aware, you know, it's kind of neat, you, they always talk about in television now, the fourth wall where the actor's now talking to the audience. Uh, they, that's called the fourth wall. But here in the passage, it's really kind of cool, is here's Jehu going along, and every once in a while, like, hey, I'm part of a big, bigger picture, <laughs> right? I can see myself doing God's work right now, because I remember when I was in the field, and I remember when Elijah confronted Ahab and said such and such, and I'm doing it right now. How amazing is that, right? And then when he's eating dinner and they come back, we can't find very much of Jezebel. He's like, hold up. I'm a part of God's plan again, <laughs> right? Like this fulfills his word. It's kind of humorous in a certain way that he's got the self-awareness. And yet the problem is his self-awareness of being used by God never translates into personal devotion to God. Um, and, and that's the, one of the critical, two of the critical weaknesses of Jehu is he doesn't take it to the, the next logical step. If you see God working, why are you not giving your life completely over to him? Don't just say, I see God working. Commit your way to the Lord and obey him in all things. Um, when you see that you're being used in such a fashion, this is not something you take pleasure in. Uh, that's why we're mindful that, that we're, we're, the big truth is, is you and I, we, there is a judgment day that is coming. We are to warn people of the judgment. We don't warn people gleefully. We warn people with the, I care about you. There's a serious day coming. You have an opportunity to escape the judgment to come, and it's found in the person of Jesus Christ, in the shed blood of Jesus, who, who took upon himself the punishment you deserve and I deserve. That's the, how amazing it is when we talk about Jesus. He literally took the punishment I deserve. Uh, so that, and, and, and so then I think, okay, well, how am I supposed to live as one so blessed by God and experience the grace of God in such a way? That's the question we all ask. And so we're, when as we go through this, uh, we're mindful, these are the faults of Jehu. Uh, Jehu, um, he took pleasure in what he was doing. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, even when it's his righteous justice being done and it, and it was needful to be done. The third thing is our passage is false worship is always unacceptable to God. You know, we're reminded, if you read the whole account, the whole account is chapter 9 and 10. We have no time to go through 9 and 10 together. Uh, but he's called out, as every other Israelite king in the north was, why didn't, if you're going to get rid of the land of the prophets of Baal, why didn't you pull down those horrible golden calves and lead people back to God. If you're so zealous for the ways of the Lord as you say you are, why don't you commit yourself completely to his way? Uh, and, and, you know, we always wonder about the, you remember Jews in the New Testament, they don't like Samaritans. 
where are things happening? Up in Samaria was the capital city of, of Israel in the north, Jezreel. Jesus is with the woman at the well, um, and he says, yeah, can you give me some water? And then he talks about giving her living water. The end of the, of the account is beautiful because she comes to Jesus recognizing him to be the Messiah. But first, Jesus calls out her false religion, and he says, you and your people, you have no idea what you're worshiping. In fact, you don't, you don't know anything. Zeal without knowledge. Christ ha had the courage to say, your religion is completely false and offensive to my father. Uh, there is, God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And he points to himself and says, I'm the Messiah that you're waiting, that you and your fellow people are waiting for. And she believes him. That's the amazing thing is she just, she goes and brings people to, him, to Christ and they said, now we believe not because of what you told us, but because we see him for ourselves." It's an amazing account, but it finds its roots all the way back here in the passage. And God's call is, you know, we live in a pluralistic world and if we're not supposed to say, we're, the culture says, don't, don't criticize or say that yours is the only religion and yet, or only true faith. Yeah, that's what the scripture says. There is no name given to us by which we must be saved rather than the name of Jesus Christ. Every other religion is false and offensive to God. That's not politically correct. But it's not me making that up. It's the scriptures. It's God himself who says, worship me in spirit and truth. Don't try to come to me making up your own way. I have set before you a way to come to me, and it's through my son, Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in no one else but him alone. That's God's call, and it's about purity of a purity of coming to him, coming to him on his terms, not our own. Um, then, the, the, this is a big lesson, two more to go. We can't just follow the, God, the, the commands of God that we like or agree to or suit our purposes or our ambitions. You know, when Jehu, that was a big day for him. Guy shows up, says, hey, come with me. Pours oil over his head. You're now the new king of Israel and you have a job, wipe out Ahab. And he's like, I like the sound of what you're saying, <laughs> right? I like the idea of being king, and, I, and I'm going to go do it. And he does it with all the gusto in the world. Because he says, well, God, that's God's command. Well, what about God's command to get rid of the golden calves? That didn't suit his purposes. It's the pick and choose. You and I, we get uncomfortable. We're like, okay, I'm following Jesus. But, you know, some of Jesus' commands, some of the teachings of the scriptures are so radical. What do you mean don't have sex before you're married? <laughs> right? What do you mean about this and about that? You know, it's okay to lie sometime and okay, and da, 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 right? No, God says to you and I, you belong to me. Christ shed his blood for you. Uh, my, my call in your life is complete surrender and yielding to me on your part. That's what it means to, to serve me and follow me. Uh, and so despite our discomfort with the commands of God, because why are we discomforted? Because we don't want to change, really. There's always this back and forth inside of us where we're like kind of ambivalent about this because that's so radical. Can I not just follow Jesus and follow these little these parts of Jesus and, not, and the rest is just too extreme? No, the lesson of Jehu is, is that we can't pick and choose how we follow God. We surrender ourselves to Christ in totality and say, my all is on the altar. Yeah, am I, am I a sinner like everyone else? Absolutely. And yet, what's in my heart, and I know it's in your heart too as a Christian. When we sin, we say, Lord, please forgive me for that. I know I'm not supposed to be doing that. Help me to follow you and live a righteous life. And we get back up and we say, I'm committed to God's ways. And if we do the same thing again, repeat the process. Rather than just we're not to be carried along and say, well, that's okay, I'll never have mastery over that. No, we say, I, my, I've been called to holiness, I've been called to follow Christ, and help me, Lord, to live as you've called me to. And then the last point, um, and it and it's also connects with that, you know, it is, Jehu shows us that it's, it's very possible, and it's happened, and, it ha and it's happened and it will happen again, it's possible for someone to be used by God and not know him. You know, you and I have this experience. God brings into our lives someone that helps us tremendously. Uh, we see the hand of God. They may even acknowledge, God brought me into your life. 
But then rather than going the next step of them completely committing themselves and their way to God, they, just, they are able to observe it. They're able to say God was part of it. And then they carry on and live their life doing what they want. And so it's more than possible to be used by God um, and yet not know him at all. Uh, and Jehu is that guy. He, he, his self-awareness is just mind-boggling. He's like, I'm being used by God right now. That's in, that's in, those are incredible observations on his part. Seeing how he's part of the, of, 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 of the big picture, and yet he doesn't take it, in, in, it doesn't, it's not real for him, it's not authentic. And I, you know, one of the things, and as I, you know, I, I'm just walking with, with you together. Yeah, that's what it is as Christians, isn't it? We walk together trying to serve Christ. Every day is a battle for us when it comes to trying to follow Jesus. For every single one of us. Because we realize there's this call to authenticity, a call to holiness, a call to devotion. And we see our inward battle going on all the time. And then we say, okay, Lord, I really need your help. And I'm really sorry for messing that up so badly and sinning so badly. I know I'm not supposed to be that person. But being authentic means getting up and saying, but I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm going to pursue Christ. I want to follow him from my heart. That's what authenticity is. The picking and choosing is not following from your heart. It, and and the, so when we look at Jehu and we say, that guy... He could have had so much more if he'd, he, he, he could have been amazing. And yet he's, actually I read this amazing sermon by, uh, um, I forget what it is, some, actually, I, I can't remember the name of the site, but um, the title of the sermon was A Successful Failure. He is successful on the surface, and yet underneath it all, he fails. Because he's not genuine, he's not authentic, it's not real, and yet, God uses the guy anyways. And so then we say, okay, help me to be authentic in my following of Jesus, coming from my heart. That's what I have for you today. Neat passage. God, and, and so many amazing lessons for us. Uh, and, and always, you know, every scripture is pointing us to Christ. Even uh, as we look at this, particularly when we think God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. And how do we, what's the, the supreme example of that? is when we come to the table, the Lord's Supper, we come to a table where we think, oh, I'm, I'm as a follower of Jesus. Jesus took the punishment I deserve that I might have the forgiveness of my sins and eternal life. Um, God's amazing provision. Go to the next slide, please, Juliana. And then, I, then just to t connect it, this past Wednesday at our Zoom get-together, we looked at, you know, you know one of the names for God is uh, uh, Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? The Lord, our provider. And there's an account where he looked at in um, Kings is, and it was, there's this widow, um, her husband was a prophet, he dies, they've got two kids, they owed some, they had some bills, the creditors are coming, they're going to take her kids into slavery and take everything she has. And she comes to Elisha, she's like, this is my situation. Like, there's no way out. And so then this miracle is done where he says, okay, collect as many jars as you can, and you got any oil in your house? She's got, a, she's got like a little tiny jar. Well, just continue pouring out of your little jar uh, and, uh, and pour it into all the, in which you're like, that's impossible, right? Well, it's a miracle, because <laughs> she fills up every jar, and then, she's, and then he says, sell what you have, and then use the proceeds to live on. And God, this, it's an amazing miracle of practical provision for someone in desperate need. But then we think, okay, what is, what is the table of the Lord? It is, is, if the Lord is our provider, the greatest provision of all is that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That's the most, if God as provider has, not only does he provide our physical needs, and he says that to the disciples who are worried, what are, you know, we've left everything to follow you. What are we going to eat? Where are we going to sleep? How are we going to get by in life? And Jesus is like, God takes care of the sparrows. Uh, he's going to take care of you. Um, and, and so God, our provider, but the greatest provision of all is Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. There's been provision for the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And so I, did, I want you to just to take a moment of quiet thanks to God for his work on the cross. And then Wendy and Rob, I'm going to ask if you would help me distribute um, 
the, the cup and, and the, the cracker this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We think of your word and we pray that you would bind it to our hearts. There's so much content we've looked at, but we've, 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 thought, uh, we've thought about authenticity. We've thought about genuineness of following you from our hearts. We've, we've looked at your word coming to pass. And so we, I pray you would speak to our hearts and where each of us need to be spoken to about how to follow you and how to live for you. And our devotion is to the person of Jesus Christ. And we think, Lord, of how is it that we've come to be in this place of one's forgiven? It's because of your shed blood. You died on the cross for us. You took the punishment that we deserve. And so as we follow you, we pray we would always be found with our eyes fixed upon you, ever mindful as you've commanded to do so in remembrance of you, thanking you. And uh, we pray that you'd also use us to encourage one another, for we stray to the right and to the left so often. And so we pray you would use us in each other's lives, that we might spur one another on in holiness and righteousness and good deeds, holding on to your promises and holding on to our faith in Jesus Christ. We pray so in your name. Amen. Uh, Wendy and Rob, if you could help uh, with this. And uh, what I'm going to ask, Wendy and Rob are going to, for those of you participating in the Lord's Table, um, the top layer... Go ahead, Wendy and Rob. Uh, the top layer is uh, a film, and underneath that's the cracker, and then under the second layer is uh, the juice. Um, we take uh, in remembrance, and we'll do it together. Uh, we do so in remembrance according to the command of Christ, um, who calls us to remember his work. Um, it is a uh, solemn act for us as the followers of Christ, for we think about our call. We think about the grace of God in our lives. And so when, after they're finished, then just peel that back, and then we'll, we'll partake and, and eat of this, these symbols together. It really is such an odd experience, isn't it? Unwrapping everything. <laughs> and yet, we do so in obedience to Christ because you know, we, we need to be mindful. We serve a, a Savior who gave his life for us, uh, who rose again, and, our, and it's because of the shed blood of Jesus that we have the forgiveness of our sins. For I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Delaney, would you close our service today in prayer? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord, for this salvation. There is happy in you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Alini, and thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a great week, and uh, let's make sure we pray for one another. It's a stressful week for students back to school, folks back to work, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll have our masks. There's some hand sanitizer if you brought your offering. The plate is there, and Juliana, would you just press the next song and play as we go out, and I hope you have a blessed week.